Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, from across the JCU community and beyond. I'd like to welcome you to the seventh edition of JCU's Conversations with Alumni series and the third in 2021. My name is Jack Rowden and I'm a proud alumnus of James Cook University and a former staff member of the Alumni Relations team. It's been a great pleasure to continue hosting these panel sessions once every two months, featuring some of JCU's extraordinary alumni in discussions about the most pressing matters of our time. JCU is a place close to my heart and I love being able to continue meeting some of its more remarkable products who are motivating great change around the world. We have a terrific webinar ahead. However, before we continue, I wish to acknowledge the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first inhabitants of this country and pay my respects to the traditional owners and elders, past and present, of land on which JCU conducts its business. In the spirit of reconciliation, I also acknowledge the valuable contribution that Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples continue to make to James Cook University and the broader community. Well, to all of our alumni in our audience, thank you very much for joining us. As always, our list of registrants highlights the global span of our alumni community. And throughout this series, we've been joined by alumni in more than 60 countries from all corners of the world. And again, we certainly have an international audience befitting a topic which all of us on earth can take interest in, and that is the future of energy. The pursuit of energy has been a quintessential undertaking within the human narrative. The agricultural revolution of early history saw us grow beyond the bounds of human strength, employing animal power to haul bulk goods across vast distances. In the 1700s, the Industrial Revolution saw the discovery and mass uptake of new energy sources such as oil, gas, steam, and eventually electricity, without which the fourth quantum leap of our history, the ongoing digital revolution, which allows us to meet here today, would never have been possible. Over the past 250 years, our species has surged forward at an astronomical and often forgotten pace fueled by these energy sources. We live longer, stronger, faster, and richer because of them. However, the energy narrative is at a crossroads as a damage bill of centuries of fossil fuel consumption, rising inequalities, and developing world industrialization present a confluence of challenges. Now to bring light to the future of energy and all those challenges, I am thrilled to be joined by a wonderful, experienced all alumni panel, which we're honored to have comprising three distinguished distinguished graduates of JCU. As I've remarked right throughout this series, as an alumnus of JCU myself, I am proud to count myself amongst the same group as our esteemed panelists who join us this evening and all of you in the audience doing wonderful things around the world. So let me begin by introducing our panel. Firstly, I am delighted to introduce Aaron George, who graduated from James Cook University in 2009 with a Master's of Dispute Resolution and a Master's of Business Administration. Aaron is currently the founder and CEO of Avant Garde Innovations, a clean tech startup established in India with a noble goal of tackling energy poverty across the developing world through innovations in clean technologies and distributed re renewable energy. Aaron and Avant Garde have been globally recognized with the company chosen twice by the United Nations amongst the top 20 clean tech innovations in India. What a fantastic achievement. And Aaron's contribution to sustainability is highlighted by the fact that he was selected as one of 10 Indians invited to attend the official launch of the UN Sustainable Development Goals in New York back in 2015. Aaron has subsequently been named one of the 50 most impactful green leaders and one of the top 25 tech leaders from India by various peak bodies and commentators. We're thrilled to have Aaron joining us from India to contribute his valuable input into this discussion. So welcome, Aaron, and wow, what a career you've put together, hey? My great pleasure, Jack, for joining me and inviting me to this uh, webinar. Thank you so much. No problems. And now, uh, next, we're pleased to welcome Paul Brophy, who graduated from James Cook University in 1978 with a Master's of Science before going on to forge a rather extraordinary 40-year career in the uh, geothe geothermal energy industry. Paul's career truly has been a global one, having worked on and stewarded international geothermal projects in the Philippines, Mexico, Djibouti, West Africa, and Ireland, just to name a few. And since 1980, he's been based in California, where he formed EGS Incorporated in 1995. 
The firm provides consulting services supporting subsurface development of both high and low temperature geothermal systems. He's currently the president of that company and in 2011 was awarded the Joseph F. Adlin Award for services to the geothermal industry in the United States. Paul's completed two terms as the president of the Geothermal Resources Council in the US, which is a peak body for geothermal practitioners. Welcome, Paul. Congratulations also on a fantastic career and thank you for taking the time to join us from California, where I believe it's about 1.30 in the morning. Is that correct? That is correct. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be a part of your webinar. Our pleasure, our pleasure, Paul. And finally, we are pleased to welcome Ben Barr, the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Energy Market Commission, an independent statutory body which makes and amends the energy rules and provides expert energy policy advice. Ben graduated from James Cook University with a Bachelor of Economics in 1992 and now has over 20 years experience in energy and climate change policy. He has a deep understanding of the national energy market and opportunities for renewable energy with a track record of providing strategic policy advice to governments across a diverse range of resource management areas and a strong interest in effective modern governance. He was the Secretary of the Council for the Australian Federation, a collaborative intergovernmental group of state and territory first ministers and, and spent six years as the Deputy Director General in the Queensland Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy. Welcome from Sydney lockdown, Ben. It's great to have you with us. Thanks, Jack. Thanks. I'm really looking forward to the session. Uh, I wish I was at, at JCU uh, rather than Sydney lockdown, but uh, I'm sure it's going to be a great session. We'd love to have you up here at some stage. Well, look, once again, thank you to all three panellists for joining us. We really appreciate it, particularly Paul joining us at uh, 1.30 in the morning. It's an outstanding panel that we have here tonight to take us through this session, um, exploring what the future of energy looks like. So now to our audience, uh, should you have any questions that you'd like one of our three panellists to address throughout the session, please pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll ende uh, endeavour to get them answered towards the end of the webinar. So without further ado, let's get stuck into it. Aaron, I would like to start with you. Um, throughout this session, we're aiming to explore the future of energy solutions. And there's little doubt that renewables will continue to grow in importance and prominence as they have done at a remarkable pace over the last 10 years. I was wondering if you could share with us a little more about the avant-garde innovation that you've developed, uh, but also wind power more broadly. What market share does wind power have currently and how important is it uh, to the global power grid? Oh, we seem to have lost uh, Aaron. Okay, um, well, we won't be able to find out much about the uh, avant-garde innovation, but Ben, I was wondering, uh, I might put you on the spot here. Um, Renewables, uh, the global power grid and uh, wind power, what uh, what sort of market share does it have at the moment and how do you see that changing? Yeah, wind is wind globally is now one of the cheapest forms of energy, actually. It's been a real success story over the last 20 years and really it's around about, gone from about 0% at large scale electricity and in, in the start of the uh, century to about six, six and a half percent globally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really the international energy agency is predicting that's going to quadruple uh, out to 2040. And uh, it's a really mature technology now. And you're really seeing those cost reductions coming from, you're getting bigger turbines. Um, you know, there's a really impressive wind farm in North Queensland, the Mount Animal Wind Farm out of the Atherton Tablelands. Mm -hmm. And once upon a time, people thought you couldn't actually get wind to stack up in Queensland, the wind resource wasn't enough, but the technology's got so good and so efficient, uh, you're seeing it really infiltrate uh, lots of different areas of the globe. Um, and the other big story coming in wind is actually offshore wind. So, uh, you know, we don't have any offshore wind in Australia, but uh, certainly in Europe uh, and other markets, you're seeing uh, this big growth area they're looking at where uh, you're sticking turbines on, uh, uh, you know, in the sea, basically and really picking up those that strong uh, wind resource uh, that, that happens uh, off, offshore. Yeah, terrific. I think I've, uh, I've actually driven past that uh, wind farm up in North Queensland. I was just reading recently that uh, South Korea is deployed or um, you know, investing in infrastructure for one of the largest uh, wind power projects in the world, offshore wind power, as you mentioned there. So that's uh, very interesting. Great response there, uh, Ben, although I'll put you on the spot there. Um, look, Paul, I'm going to cross to you now. Um, most people, including laymen like me, can put uh, two and two together with the concept of wind power. Um, but geothermal power, it's not really a uh, universally understood concept. 
So drawing on your lifetime of experience in the sector, um, would you be able to give us a bit of a brief introduction into what geothermal energy is, uh, how it's harnessed and where it's used? Yes, sure. Um, uh, it's a little difficult to uh, give a background in geothermal without uh, the aid of a PowerPoint, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. And essentially, geothermal energy is the use of the heat energy located in the crust in the upper part of the mantle. Um, we know that the temperature increases as, as you go uh, from the surface into the crust. That temperature geothermal gradient is somewhere in the range of about 25 to 30 degrees centigrade, centigrade per kilometer in most parts of the world. So we can expect to get to boiling point of water around a depth of about three or four kilometers, pretty much anywhere. Uh, and this is even on, by today's standards, a reasonable depth to be thinking about drilling. However, if we really want to utilize that heat in some way, uh, it's most efficiently done if you can uh, uh, access higher temperatures at shallower depths. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the most common place we find such elevated geothermal gradients obviously will be associated with areas of recent volcanism. Uh, and by recent, I, you know, I don't mean something like we see on YouTube uh, that's happening in Iceland. Uh, I'm talking about something in the, in the range of a thousand, maybe 10,000 years old. Um, but before we go any further with that, let's just take a step back and discuss the, the three main ways that geothermal energy can be extracted from the subsurface. And these three ways are, are, are primary based on temperature. First, our, our, our high temperature geothermal resources, these are most commonly understood uh, uh, form of geothermal and, and is involves the generation of electricity. Uh, wells drilled into resources produce either dry steam uh, or flash steam with water. Uh, dry steam will go straight into a turbine while flashed steam systems, which are by far more common, um, uh, we'll use a separator to separate the hot water and the steam, but both then uh, uh, drive turbines directly in a, in a way that any other uh, electrical generation system, natural gas, oil forms. Uh, lower than, uh, and these temper the temperature of these things are, uh, are somewhere between 130 degrees C, maybe up to about 300 degrees C. For, for lower temperature power generation, below 180 degrees C, uh, we don't use uh, flash systems or, or normal turbines. It's more efficient to use heat exchangers uh, with a working fluid on a basic principle of a Rankine cycle. So because of high temperatures are involved, the most of these geothermal sites are loco located in volcanic areas. Specifically, the major area would be the Ring of Fire, anywhere uh, from the South American coast, West Coast, up through Central America, California, up through uh, Oregon, uh, Canada, and then down through uh, Eastern Russia, Japan, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, and perhaps the most southern one is New Zealand. So that's the primary area where you where, where anywhere where you expect to see volcanism, that's where you would expect to see, uh, uh, find a geothermal system. Uh, the other areas, there are other areas where these higher temperature systems occur. Iceland is one, Hawaii is one, Azores, these are uh, islands in the uh, mid-Atlantic or mid-Pacific ridges. You see uh, geothermal in Southern Europe, uh, uh, Greece, Italy, Turkey, uh, and also along the East Africa rift zone. That's from uh, north end of Djibouti right the way through to the southern end of the, of the rift zone. So that, that's the high temperature systems. And that's one that I think uh, I'd like to talk more about or, or, or focus on in, in these discussions. But there are other uses, and we shouldn't forget those. Below 130 C, we can use the hot water directly. Uh, it's commonly called direct use, uh, and it's used to heat buildings, dry crops and vegetables, 
heat swimming pools, spas, uh, and even run HVAC systems. And the third and final uh, use for geothermal, it is not where we uh, withdraw any fluids or anything from the subsurface, but uh, they're known as ground source heat, heat pumps. Uh, uh, and that involves just using the thermal conductivity of the shallow, uh, shallow ground run pipes through that, and then it keeps uh, buildings cooler during the summer months and warmer during the, uh, 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 the winter months. Um, so to get back to exploring and developing for geothermal resources, uh, there are three physical parameters that you're looking for. You're looking for high temperature, of course. You're looking for available water, um, and fluids. Uh, it doesn't necessarily always be water, mostly. And thirdly, you need permeability pathways. These are fractures or forts in the rock that allow water to be able to flow uh, from depth uh, where they've been heated up into the depth range that you can drill and access them. Uh, now, in recent years, uh, rather than extracting fluid from, uh, from the subsurface. There's been a lot of research into methods in which you can uh, you extract the heat, uh, uh, not by removing water, but by, by fracturing the rocks themselves and putting water in from the surface through these manufactured fractures and then uh, you, extracting it out from uh, uh, an extraction well. And these are sort of uh, being termed either enhanced or engineered geothermal systems. And, and, and they're worth mentioning because when we get down to Australia and what opportunities Australia has for geothermal systems, uh, it doesn't, it, it, unfortunately, it doesn't look really great. Um, Australia is, a, is an old continent. So there really isn't any extensive volcanism or, or volcanic fields where high temperature geothermal systems are likely to use. As a result, there are no uh, high temperature systems uh, in, in Australia. There was a small uh, electrical power system in uh, Birdsville in Queensland that I think was decommissioned. And you can tell me if I'm right or wrong on that. And I believe that there are also uh, uh, a couple of systems that are being planned in Queensland, um, uh, but they're all under a megawatt. Uh, and this is relatively small fry. Yep. So, but there are a number of uh, direct use projects and there's been a lot of focus around the world on how best to use direct use projects. Uh, uh, and for some reason or other, there seems to have been uh, a, a common use seen in, in, in many parts of uh, Australia, using them for, for sports centres to, to, right. to heat sports centre buildings. And I don't know why sports mm. centre buildings should be uh, specific, uh, but that's what seems to have happened. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and there's more spas and hot spring resorts uh, being developed, uh, uh, which, is, which is good to see. So. That's the background of geothermal. Uh, yeah. And in order to save time, I, I, I'll try and focus the rest of my discussions on the high temperature systems because they're the major ones that can impact uh, uh, global climate change. Terrific. Thank you very much, Paul. It's a, it's a comprehensive uh, sweep through geothermal. As you said, not, not easy when you don't have uh, the visual aids there, but you did a terrific job, so thanks very much. Um, and I would like to get back to you uh, just uh, shortly, Paul, around the challenges around geothermal and other uh, renewables. But in the meantime, um, Ben, moving on to you now, given your role, um, you have a nuanced understanding of the energy market here in Australia as it sits right now. Um, and largely, uh, uh, you know, a large portion of our audience is joining us here uh, from Australia tonight. So um, drawing from your broad view of the market, I was wondering if you could fill us in on some of the variety of energy sources used to power our nation on any given day. Um, and how has this compilation sort of changed over the last decade or so? Yeah, thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, so really, I mean, the national electricity market is one of the longest connected markets in the world. It's like 5,000 kilometres from Port Douglas in far north Queensland to Port Lincoln in South Australia and all the way to Tassie. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, even though it's connected, it's actually hard to move the energy around. So you've got a really um, a wide variety of sources. There isn't much geothermal, unfortunately. Paul's right about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we had high hopes once upon a time, but it's just too expensive to drill the wells. Uh, but you've got coal, both brown and black coal. Uh, you've got gas, natural gas, wind, hydro, large scale solar. Uh, and then a lot of small scale solar on people's roofs as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. And you're now getting more grid connected batteries. And that really has changed a lot in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, fossil fuels was about 95% uh, of the energy uh, generated and consumed in Australia, about 70% of that being coal and 20 to 25% natural gas. And you're seeing this transition in Australia happening at speed at two ends of the system. So at the big end of the system, you're seeing these large generators leave the market and be replaced by lots of smaller generators, wind, uh, and large scale solar generally, but also also still a bit of gas and uh, grid connected batteries. And at the small end of town on people's roofs, Australia is really world leading. You've got one in five households with solar PV on their roof and we anticipate that could be one in two uh, by 2030. And that brings great opportunity but also a great challenge for the electricity sector uh, in Australia. And I think the other, the other major game changer um, that's happening is storage. So, you know, electricity is one of these things where storage was very expensive and you had to balance demand and supply instantaneously across a big country. And that often meant you needed more generation uh, in reserve. But now storage, the price of storage is falling and there's different kinds of storage. And that really, whether again, at the household level, whether it's electric vehicles or batteries on wheels coming into the market or grid connected batteries or pumped hydro, uh, that will really um, speed that transition along as well. Um, and I'll talk, I can talk a bit more about that later. Terrific. Thanks, Ben. That's, uh, that's, yeah, that's fascinating. Aaron is back. Um, but uh, just some of those numbers on there. I mean, 95% of fossil fuels um, in the market uh, 10 years ago. It's just fascinating to see how that's changing. And, you know, where we are based here in Townsville, it's, it's easy to see that manifesting um, the solar panels on roofs because it seems like every second house that you uh, drive past here in Townsville has solar panels on the roof. So, um, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, so interested to, to talk a bit more on those points you mentioned there just before, but um, Aaron, you are back, you've joined us. Uh, so Aaron, I want to ask you uh, this question, um, harnessing the Earth's naturally renewing energy sources um, that we've been talking about so far in the session, it seems like the obvious low hanging fruit uh, for us being the world's most dominant species, but yet yeah, little over a quarter of our power globally is drawn from these sources and in some countries even less. Uh, mm, that global market share is projected to grow uh, almost half by 2040. But what do you see as some of the challenges for increasing the market share of uh, wind power, but also more broadly, the uh, uptake of clean energy sources? Well, I can talk from our perspective when we started the company and then got innovations. So we looked into what's, what's there available in the market in the renewable energy sector for the residential as well as the commercial customers. And when we looked into that, we realized that solar is obviously there in both residential and commercial, but that's not the same for wind. Wind is just there in the industrial sector and, and to an extent in the commercial sector, but definitely not in the um, residential sector to, to an extent where solar is already today. So we looked into why that is the reason. So the reason, one of the two reasons we found was that the cost was a very prohibitive factor mm -hmm. for small wind turbines, uh, especially when you compare that with the cost of uh, solar today. Um, rooftop solar. And the second thing was efficiencies. So wind, just like solar, is actually available in most of the countries. The thing is that to tap the wind energy, you need to have some kind of efficiencies in the wind turbine um, uh, on a residential scale. And when I say residential scale means it's not like the large wind turbines that put on a 100 meter height. So these residential uh, uh, rooftop small wind turbines are about 10 meter, 20 meter, or 30 meter the most. So you need to have that kind of efficiencies in technology for um, um, harnessing the wind power at those such kind of uh, low uh, heights. So that's where we look into what was the uh, hindrance and what are the problems and uh, issues uh, that the sector itself is having, which is actually prohibiting itself from uh, moving forward. And uh, so that's what we started, started off working on um, when we started the company. And uh, um, so today what we've done is actually have a wind turbine just much more um, and affordable when you compare to the European or American counterparts and also efficient at low wind speeds. So 
developing these kind of um, technologies which can actually uh, harness what is available in the, na in, in the natural resources at a lower cost and with the far more better accessibility is the key to actually tapping the natural resources that's already available everywhere. And that's, uh, um, yeah, so, yes. That's terrific, Aaron. I think it's a fantastic innovation. We missed uh, we missed out on hearing about your innovation a bit early on when uh, we didn't have you in the session. But that that point there about sort of uh, ironing out some of the kinks of these technologies because they are young technologies, um, you know, in the relative scheme of things. Um, it's a great segue to um, to a question I'd like to ask Paul. So, Paul, a, a quick glance at your CV, and you mentioned just before in uh, in your previous answer that geothermal power tends to be drawn from those uh, remote sites, I guess, far away from you know, urban centres where, say, the loads are higher. Um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on how you see uh, geothermal actually growing in prominence. Well, uh, it's a good observation, uh, Jack, about the uh, remoteness of, of, of the broad areas in the geothermal. But uh, it does not seem to have been a major problem, uh, at least in countries uh, that have as an established electrical grid system. Sure. Um, places say like, uh, uh, let's say Indonesia, uh, that's that they have a reasonable grid system. They have a lot of geothermal uh, potential. Uh, they are developing a lot of geothermal resources there. Uh, and it, it is not uncommon in geothermal projects to have a, a 100, 120 kilometer uh, uh, transmission line to, to the grid system. Uh, most of the systems in, um, in Nevada, in the de de desert of, uh, of Nevada, uh, are, are, a lot of them are linked into the California grid system with, uh, with the transmission lines. So it doesn't really seem to have, have restricted the development of geothermal uh, energy, at least in the US. And I think in those 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 areas that have a, a pretty good grid system to start with, um, I, 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 in the again in the US uh, uh, there are certain um, disadvantages to geothermal uh, uh, that it has impeded its growth over the years. It, it has been uh, it has a very very slow low growth. In, in most countries, uh, something in the order of one, two percent over the years. And when you look at what's happening with wind and solar, uh, uh, that has had a, a major impact on geothermal. For example, I can remember five, ten years ago, solar in, uh, in, in the United States was about $150 per megawatt. Uh, now it's down, we're seeing uh, uh, PPAs in, in, in California uh, at round about, well, I've seen one at three cents per kilowatt hour, uh, which is 30, uh, 30 dollars per megawatt. And, and generally they're around 35 or 40 dollars. Well, with geothermal, uh, it is very difficult for, for uh, private developers to make any money uh, less than seven cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, so that has really, really slowed the growth of geothermal. Um, uh, and I think there is a, a huge potential for geothermal. We haven't discovered anywhere near all the systems that are out there. Early development in the 60s and 70s found large geothermal systems that were in the range of 300, 400 megawatts. That they have probably all been found now. So a lot of the most recent, and I haven't done the analysis, but a lot of the most recent uh, systems that have come online are in the 30 to 50 uh, megawatt range. Um, but the one thing that geothermal does have in its favor, uh, and I didn't want to highlight too much the, the difficulty it has, you know, competing with oil and gas, with uh, wind and solar, um, but geothermal is a base load system. And, and we're seeing in California now significant problems uh, uh, when you get to high levels of renewable. Um, we're seeing uh, utility companies not taking up any more 
large solar PPAs. Um, it's the, the, we, we have probably something in the region of 60 to 65% renewables in California already. If Now you won't see that in the numbers because as, 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 as we mentioned earlier, uh, the, uh, the calculation is not done with any um, hydro projects. Sure. They, they are taken out of it as is nuclear. Um, uh, and a lot of uh, the motivation for development of geothermal systems is coming from the government legislation. That's really what's driving the, the albeit small growth for, for geothermal. Uh, and, and, and when you look at the capacity factors of, and I don't want to be negative about wind and solar, but when you look at the capacity factors there and add in the cost of, uh, uh, of battery storage, and, and I agree it is coming down, then if you look at it from that perspective, then geothermal looks a lot better, competes a lot better on a financial basis. Yeah. And, and I think that will be the driver for future, um, uh, future development of geothermal. Very there, will, there will be a ceiling that you hit uh, uh, with, with so much uh, solar and wind online, just because of the capacity factor. Well, I'll be interested uh, to hear from the other panelists on that one. So thank you very much, uh, Paul. But uh, Ben, we've spoken uh, for much of this session about renewables. This really has been a focus, um, you know, as humanity sort of collectively tackles the sustainable development goals. Um, but as it stands, the vast majority of power needs of a burgeoning global population are met by fossil fuels. And that's even higher in Australia, too. So what role do you see them playing in the future of energy um, and why? Yeah, thanks, Jack. I mean, it, it's going to diminish. Uh, and it's just the pace that it's going to diminish. You know, this, this transition is happening globally. Uh, and the price of those renewable technologies is falling at such a rate. I took a bit about Australia first, really. So, you know, really, you're looking probably at all coal plants in Australia leaving the market by 2040s, it, probably earlier. And the issue is that they're really struggling to make money. Uh, and so it's the economics that is driving the transition as much as the, the low carbon, the cost of those new technologies and the inability to finance fossil fuel projects, uh, particularly in the OECD countries, is um, uh, US being different with gas projects. I'll talk a bit about gas in a minute. Um, and so that transition is going to happen. They are really important in that transition because it's not this thing where you can just shazam them all shut overnight and move to 100% renewables. You've got to manage that transition transition. They provide these services, they're big spending machines, and they keep the power system stable. And so we're working now in Australia about how do we provide those services through what we call inverter-based technologies, whether it's a wind farm or a solar farm or a battery. How do you get those frequencies stable where you used to rely on the coal plants spinning to do it for free? And I think, um, you know, gas is, is interesting because it, it's got this um, flexibility. Uh, like like a battery, uh, currently it gets used, sometimes it gets used in baseload, and I think that's going to end pretty quickly because the price of gas is too expensive and there's too much carbon. But uh, there could still be a role for that, that uh, you know, support gas provides when you have large penetrations of renewables and you have what these things called uh, wind droughts or uh, you just can't get the long duration storage, you know, storage of over... Uh, three or four days um, from uh, good connected batteries. So, I mean, it, it will be leaving, it'll be leaving globally as the world decarbonise. It's just a question of when and managing that transition. Very interesting. Well, I'm going to ask you a bit further on, uh, Ben, to grab the crystal ball and tell us a little bit about uh, 2031. Um, but just uh, before we go on to that, uh, I'd urge the audience too, to please send through your questions in the Q&A. Um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time uh, for some questions at the end, but please pop them in there now so that we can uh, work out where to get them into the session. Um, Aaron, I'd like to go back to you now. Uh, as we move into the sort of final half or the final third of this session, I really want to hone in on what that future of energy looks like. And, uh, you know, renewables appear for all, everything we've spoken about here uh, to be firmly a part of that future. Um, so I'd like to actually ask you about Avant-Garde's mission statement, which I think is terrific. And it speaks about eliminating energy poverty and reducing dependence on uh, struggling state power grids. 
So it's commonly accepted that renewables are a solution for the environmentally oriented uh, SDGs, but how can they also contribute to reducing poverty and improving um, human development outcomes as well? Absolutely, in a certain big way. The future is the future of energy is going to be decentralized energy rather than the concentrated uh, energy sector um, or the, the the scenario we had all this decade so far, um, and and that's that's a no brainer. And especially with the advent of more rooftop solar or even small wind turbines um, and, and, and other technologies and so forth. And especially with the prices coming down with storage, it's definitely going to be uh, you know um, a, a scenario with where you have a lot of microgrids. Um, so there'll be more resilience in the grid itself because of that. So uh, that's undoubtedly the case. Um, in terms of future potential, it's literally we have not even scratched. Uh, to give you an example of India, um, we have we are actually the world's fourth fourth largest producer of wind, and we have just barely touched about um, 40 gigawatts right now. And uh, the potential in India for uh, for large wind sector it's about 600 gigawatts. Um, so it, it's nowhere there. It's not even one tenth where we have reached so far. And the same scenario is, in fact, in fact, it's even more um, you know, starker when you look into the small wind turbine sector. In the small wind turbine sector, the, the 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 total potential in the country is about 83 gigawatt, whereas we have today hardly five megawatt from small wind turbine. So as you can see it's a mammoth uh, gap between the 83 gigawatt and the five megawatt. So the potential is there. Uh, it's just about having the, the right government uh, uh, policies, incentives, and of course the infrastructure, um, and of course awareness uh, for uh, uptaking the renewable energy potential. Um, and uh, small wind turbine, to be specific, has got a lot more opportunities to, to actually um, um, you know, improve the grid, as well as to actually, uh, coming back to your question about improving the livelihoods. Because unlike solar, uh, wind is something that can enable people to continue working even after sunset hours. So that means a lot of uh, small businesses, a lot of people uh, you know, where there is no grid at all, uh, remote communities, they can continue working, continue keeping their lights on, continue running their small shops. And that's, and that's actually uh, uh, you know, contributing to their livelihood. So wind has a lot more potential uh, for contributing to this uh, future of energy, um, along with solar, of course. And uh, like I said, it's, it's right now it's untapped and we see great, great potential for wind, even in the EV sector, because in electric vehicles, you are currently having a grid for charging your electric cars, which actually totally fails the purpose of going electric. You need to have renewable energy powering your electric vehicles. And right now, the other solution is solar. And again, like I said, solar is only there until sunset. What do you do? You cannot put your car back in the garage after sunset, right? You need to keep driving. So you need to add something more. So it could be any kind of technologies, any kind of renewable energy, as long as it is clean. And wind has a great potential over there also because it can literally give you power 24 hours wherever the wind is there. So even for EVs, uh, wind turbines, especially small decentralized wind turbines are going to be a, a, a huge contributing factor for um, expanding and accelerating the, you know, the uptake of electric vehicles in the world. So the, the potential is literally, we've literally scratched the surface and we have a lot more uh, to go with that. Terrific, Aaron. What's a, what a uh, very inspiring answer. Um, I've seen the uh, impact of energy poverty both in my travels in India and also in Papua New Guinea um, and seeing, the, you know, for example, uh, for children that are studying just to have a light at home at nights that runs off a, a solar grid. Um, it's just incredible. And like you say, livelihoods and all the small uh, small shops in Delhi and Jaipur to be able to continue going. I think uh, that's that's sort of what I was hoping to hear from you. And that's, uh, that's wonderful to hear. So similarly, Paul, I do have a profound interest in the developing world. And uh, I truly believe that's where humanity's future hinges, uh, particularly in this discussion. So throughout your career, um, you've worked on projects across the developing world, including Peru, Indonesia, West Africa, Djibouti, as you mentioned before. Um, many developing nations hold vast natural resources, um, as Aaron mentioned about uh, India just then, and, you know, more just closer to home here in Australia, PNG and Indonesia do spring to mind. Um, could greater investment in harnessing renewables not only improve energy poverty in these countries, but also provide them with a much needed export boost? Uh, yes, they, they could certainly assist uh, uh, um uh, in development of these countries. I'm not so sure quite so much about export boost. Um, uh, there are places uh, uh, where you could use that for, for export uh, dollars, but uh, they will be limited. 
And of course, geothermal is something that that doesn't usually lend itself to small scales. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it has a strange and unusual uh, investment profile uh, because all the money, a lot of the money that you need for a geothermal project has to be up front. Uh, and that's for drilling. And if you, if you want to develop, and, and I'm going back to larger facilities now, uh, you would have to drill probably 70, 75% of the resource before you can go to a, a really a commercial end. Uh, so, so that puts a tremendous amount of risk. Uh, and if you add the risk in that you get when you're uh, working in development countries, it's a lot to ask uh, 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 a developer to do. Um, one, one area where I think it, this would, this would with a, just a small amount of, of investment would help a lot of people, it would be the Caribbean islands. The Caribbean islands are uh, uh, you know, a series of 10, 12 volcanic systems where, where, where people live. Almost all of those, except for one or two, uh, generate by importing diesel. Uh, yet they're sitting on the side of a volcano. Uh, so you need the you need the ability to have entities to invest money to drill wells there to dis, to define the resource. Uh, and that is being very that's very difficult. Places again going back to places like Indonesia and the Philippines. Uh, uh, the, in those sort of environments where there is a good electrical infrastructure, uh, the, the normal development can be, uh, uh, can be completed uh, and it's not really as critical uh, uh, in terms of um, you know, finding out exactly you know, how that funding is going to get it. But yes, uh, when I worked in Indonesia, all they wanted was uh, US or, or European companies to come in and put capital in. Yeah. Uh, and, and they couldn't manage to persuade any real companies to do that. Uh, and, and as you, you said, Indonesia has a tremendous amount of geothermal potential, but it, it's always had trouble uh, 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 capital attracting capital, capital mm -hmm. from the rest of the world. And you need that high risk capital to be able to develop a geothermal problem. So it's a, it's a difficulty that has to be overcome. Yep, very interesting. Well, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different capital sources out there around the world with um, you know, the geopolitical system at the moment. Yes, so that'd yes. uh, be interesting to see how the, if that changes into the future. But um, Paul, while I have you, um, you were talking just before, we've just got a question from uh, Selena in the audience. I thought this is a nice time to uh, answer it. Um, very shortly, I'm gonna ask Ben to give us a bit of a, uh, look into the crystal ball to 2031 and what the energy sector looks like there. Um, Selena's asked, although geothermal is expensive, do you see a future for geothermal sources at all becoming as common as say coal usages for electricity here in Australia at all, even if it is beyond um, 2030? I know that you spoke uh, just in your answer there before about you know, geothermal doesn't lend itself to smaller applications. Could it be uh, something that replaces some of that load? Well, I, it, it's probably not going to be a resource that is going to replace something on the scale of coal. It could replace a, a certain amount of power that is required. Whatever it's replacing doesn't really matter. But, but, but yes, no, it, it does have that option. There's no reason why, why geothermal uh, couldn't be used in, in other places. Uh, I'm saying not in, in Australia. That's probably, so, in all honesty, unlikely. Interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for your question, um, Selena. Ben, um, as we move towards the conclusion of the session, um, could you describe the Australian national energy market in, say, 10 years for us um, from, from the perspective of governments and, more importantly, the consumer? I'd really like to get back to the consumer because that's what we all are here and all of us in the audience 
Um, and I might actually ask you this question as well, Aaron, um, from, from your perspective in India, but from which sources are the bulk of energy going to be derived from? Um, will energy, this is a really important question for me, is, is energy more available? Is it more accessible? And is it more affordable in 2031? Or is that all overly uh, wishful and optimistic thinking? Uh, I like optimistic thinking. That's what. That's how I, I'd start. I think that's. I think if you're in energy transition and uh, and in the world of decarbonisation, it's good to be optimistic. I think you know from a customer perspective. I think customers and governments want the same thing in Australia, which is you know uh, all states in Australia have got a net zero target by uh, 2050. They want decarbonisation of the electricity sector. That's critical uh, for the rest of the economy, and they want the lights on. And uh, there were prices, uh, if not to come down, then to be pretty stable. And I think, you know, I agree with Aaron uh, to, a, to a certain extent, like uh, decentralization of distributed energy is going to be a massive growth over the next 10 to 20 years uh, in, in Australia. But um, the grid itself is still really, really important. We've got these two big changes happening at once. You know, those coal plants leading, leaving and getting replaced placed by wind and other sources, but also that distributed energy, whether it's solar, uh, uh, batteries or electric vehicles coming in. And I'll talk about three kind of key attributes uh, we'd like to see in, in 2030. And, and one is this concept of, of, a, of a true two-sided market. Currently, kind of energy is really, in Australia, we set up about big machines getting power to you and the customer was this thing that we didn't really worry about too much, right? And that is fundamentally changing. And now not all customers are gonna care about energy like we care about energy. Some just wanna flick the switch, get the power, that's fine. But others are really gonna care about it and they're gonna to wanna to trade. They actually wanna to to trade their energy with their next door neighbor. Uh, they wanna get, to get more products and services out of it. And so that value of not just the supply side, but the demand side being just as important. And I think that's a fundamental change. Secondly, there'll be more interconnection and more digitization of that. And that's not something that's unique to energy. That's happening in all sectors of the economy. And that interconnection is going to come between states and territories because we get bulk supply around and between customers and the microgrids that Aaron talks about. You're going to get more and more of it. And the digitization and the data that comes with it is going to be critical in actually managing that transition so everyone benefits. Mm -hmm. um, what you don't want is that new technology just getting picked up by those that can afford it and those that can't afford it, um, paying the bills for those that can. And that's something at the commission we're really alive to and we wanna get the transition right for everybody. And then thirdly, the last bit, you know, uh, 2031, you know, we're still gonna have fossil fuels in the system, but less and less, we will have more wind, we will have more solar, we will have more storage of whatever form and, and kind of uh, it could be large-scale batteries, it could be pumped hydro uh, and you're going to see this change happening at a rate of knots. Uh, I think the market operator was uh, talking at a theatre conference today, so AMO keep the lights on Australia, talking about being ready for 100% renewables by 2025 at any one time, right? So not saying the entire grid's going to be 100% renewables, but being able to cope with 100% renewables by 2025. That's not very far away. Um, and getting that transition right for me means for lots of customers and governments, they're, they're, not, they're not worrying about it. It's not on the front page of the paper anymore. It's just the carbonisation is happening. People aren't looking at their bill, getting that bill shock, and we're not having uh, blackouts uh, in this country like that to me in 2031 successful. It's easy to say that. There's, there's, lots, there's lots to do to get those settings right to achieve that. Of course, of course. Um, ben, you mentioned you were at a conference earlier today. We've had a question from uh, Alistair Mills um, in the audience, and he said he's heard talk of a big project in the Pilbara in WA. Would Ben like to comment? Have you heard anything at all? Uh, I, vaguely. Like, I mean, the other thing, I mean, the Pilbara in WA, unfortunately, is slightly out of my remit. So the, um, the commission does the national electricity market, which WA is off to the side. It's the only bit that's not really interconnected. But I have heard talk. I have heard talk about. I think it's a solar storage project. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm certainly not an expert in that one. Uh, Fair enough. No worries at all. Um, so Aaron, I did mention I would love to uh, sort of ask the same question I asked to Ben to you in India. Um, it's also a place that's very close to my heart. Having spent some time there. What does this changing energy market, the shift towards renewables that we've been talking about the whole session, what does that mean for a stall owner 
Um, you know, in Delhi, what does it mean for, for people that don't have access to electricity yet uh, in some of the rural uh, villages? Tell us a little bit more about um, what you think 2031 looks like for the have-nots at the moment, for want of a better word. Well, the, um, the country is blessed with natural resources, whether it's solar or whether it's wind. It's just the, um, the lack of um, uh, various factors which have not really uh, enabled us to actually tap their true potential. Um, just, just if you take the example of wind, like I said before, we have a, a capacity of 600 gigawatt for, from the large sector. And whereas we have just touched about 40 gigawatt. And um, in the small sector, we have, like I said before, 80 gigawatt and we've barely touched five megawatt. So the reason is that there are no enabling policies, policies, um, incentives, um, even infrastructure for making that shift happen. There are only a few countries in the world, in fact, which has had which is specific policies for small wind turbines, just like they have for uh, rooftop solar. Um, for example, you have countries like US, UK, um, where they have specific uh, uh, policies and even tariffs and even incentives for small wind turbines. They call it the feed-in tariff in some of the countries. I'm not sure the, the case in Australia, whether they have a specific policy for small wind turbines. Even though Australia is huge, it's a huge, uh, a hugely uh, blessed with small uh, you know, um, um, wind potential and you can have as much as of uh, small wind turbines, as much as uh, you have in uh, rooftop solar. It's just about having the enabling policies in the first place, which will then then actually create that uh, market push and interest to actually start up taking this, uh, um, you know, the potentials. Um, and uh, I believe that technology or renewable energy itself should be uh, agnostic, uh, whether it's wind, whether it's solar. And in fact, I believe that, that the best is neither standalone wind and neither standalone solar. It should be hybrid. A combination of both, because uh, just just with the nature of both these sources, it's good to have both where where they will be to complement each other. Um, you know, when the wind is not there, the solar will, will be there, and vice versa. So um, so that's how the future should be, where you have actually more policies to actually enable the uptake, um, like policies such as net metering. Uh, right now, you have policies for net metering in solar, but not in wind, uh, and this is the case for most of the world. Um, so you need to have more um, open access policies where you enable even industries uh, to have their own um, big, large, uh, uh, not large, I mean, I would say small to medium, small wind turbines at their own factory premises. Uh, you know, generally, the industries tend to have acres of acres of land, and they have enough space for putting a, a wind turbine there. Um, and uh, if the policies are there um, uh, of open access, uh, for example, they can even start trading, like uh, Ben was saying, uh, between uh, even 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 amongst their own premises or even to other um, uh, industries, uh, maybe a few kilometers away, where there may not be as much as a wind. So open access and plus technologies like blockchain trading will actually enable that to happen. And uh, we believe so. The, the 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 foundation should be there of policies, incentives, and and awareness to actually start up thing. We have we have we have never shot up uh, renewable energy sources or natural sources. It was just the uh, factors of uh, you know um, what I, what I was saying about policies, incentives, and so forth that that is lacking today to actually uh, you know uh, push us into the future where we are largely powered by renewable energy rather than the fossil powered uh, sources. So I'm very optimistic is that in that way, uh, if that is there, the, the, the future of energy would be more greener and more cleaner. Yeah, terrific, Aaron. I think uh, uh, one thing I always find quite interesting, I think that uh, the technological advances that we've gone through in the last 250 years, as I mentioned at the start of the session, we've almost moved so quickly with technology that economics and politics are struggling to keep up. Uh, and I think that's a real barrier to, uh, to everything and the shift that we've been talking about tonight. Um, Look, we are getting towards the end of our session now, so I'd like to say um, a very warm thank you to all three um, of our esteemed panellists. Uh, what a terrific uh, group of people we had on board today. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to give our alumni community a really fascinating insight uh, into the future of energy um, and specifically the role uh, that renewable energy sources uh, can play in improving the fortunes of our planet and all of its inhabitants as well. So. I think we really find ourselves at the moment at a really critical juncture um, in the all important energy narrative. So it's been wonderful to learn more about it. I've learned plenty, I've been taking notes as well while I've been uh, moderating. So I thoroughly enjoyed the session. Thank you very much. Um, in wishing you all the best uh, for the future, this concludes tonight's conversations with alumni panel session. Um, and it's been such a pleasure to uh, be a part of these insightful discussions. 
Um, thank you to the more than the 1,200 uh, alumni who have joined us right across the world so far for these sessions. We urge you to uh, continue to check your emails and look out for the next invite in two months' time. Thank you all very much for listening. Uh, and wherever you are around the world, um, we wish you, our JCU alumni family, many safe and happy returns um, until our next time. So uh, good night and best wishes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe.